Well, good morning. Good morning. This is Good Friday. Uh, so it's one of the, Pastor Matt's called this the Super Bowl for Christianity. You know what I mean? Like, if it, if it wasn't for this, why are we even here? And Good Friday is more of a solemn moment because we're remembering what Jesus went through to actually get to resurrection on Sunday. One thing that always strikes me, especially the older I get, is not necessarily how somebody starts, is, but it's how they finish. Especially, you know, in a lot of the culture that we're living in, people have a good way of starting. You know what I mean? They hit strong. They blow up, as the kids say. It's amazing, right? So much potential, so much, so much brightness for the future. But how somebody finishes is, is, in my opinion, the older I get, more important than how they started. Lots of times we see people go through bumps in the road, and we just automatically assume, well, <laughs> they're done. And yet, the truth of the matter is, it's not how you start. It is how you finish. Good Friday shows us a few different things about how Jesus actually took the time to finish his life on earth. Most sermons you'll hear on Good Friday are all about kind of trying to focus in on how bloody and gruesome the crucifixion was. Now, can we all acknowledge that the crucifixion was bloody, awful, and horrid? Anybody? You put your hand up and say, yes, it was. It was bad. Right? We could go through how they, you know, pierce people's hands and whip people and do all that other stuff. But what strikes me about the actual day in which Jesus dies are the last moments in how he lives. And I think there are so many lessons for us in how we can actually live our lives, especially in moments of pain and struggle. You see, the whole night for Jesus starts out where he is in a garden, okay? He's having his last supper, then he's in a garden, and he's saying to God, look, I know what's about to come, but if this thing could not happen, that would be fantastic. Do you remember that part? We kind of jump over that all of the time. Jesus, the Son of God, who comes in flesh, then all of a sudden is now in the last parts of his purpose on the planet. You would think, if you've watched a lot of Marvel movies, that this guy would now suit up go into his death completely and utterly brave. You know what I mean? And yet what we see is Jesus understanding what's about to happen and asking God, look, if this cup can pass from me, <laughs> that would be great. But not my will, but what? Your will be done. So he goes through it. He goes through this awful thing. And actually... The, the title of this sermon is actually Victorious Victim, because that's exactly what he was, a victim. Did he do anything wrong? Not legally. The only thing that he had done was actually go against the religious people of that particular time. They couldn't handle it. They were losing control. They were losing power. They couldn't actually stand it. And now... They do this whole plot thing to get rid of Jesus, thinking that that is the thing that they need to do to regain power. So they do it. Jesus, this man who had done nothing wrong, gets arrested, beaten, gets bruised, gets killed. He's a victim. But the great thing about Jesus is Instead of hanging on the cross and saying, woe is me, the lead up to his actual death, he shows us how to live in the middle of our pain and of our suffering. There's about four things he does that I, I, I'm pretty impressed by. The first thing is this. He actually forgives his abusers. Right? If you want to go to the next slide. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And they divide up his clothes by casting lots. Jesus now is at the point where they've nailed him on the cross. 
It's not only the Romans doing it, it's also all of these religious Jews and all kinds of people that are looking for him to lose. And instead of him saying, you guys are awful human beings and I hope you end up in hell, he says to God, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. I want you to to recognize, though, that he doesn't now say, Romans and religious Jews, we're going to become best friends. We're going to go to parties together. It's going to be fantastic. He forgives. He releases them and releases himself from the burden of hating them. On this Good Friday, you might be in the middle of your own pain. You might feel like there have been people who have used you and abused you. And in fact, some people might, you have had a past of abuse. But many people live in these prisons where they look at themselves and they are victims. Let's not reduce that or diminish that. And yet what happens is so many people hold on to all of that pain and all of that hurt and refuse to move forward for the sake of their own freedom. But Jesus, in the middle of his pain, in the middle of his sorrow, in the middle of all the stuff he's going through, he's literally getting nailed to a cross, a bunch of wood, and he says, Father, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. Many of the people that abused you, I would say, if they truly understood what they were doing and how the effects of what it is that they did to you would have on your own life, They'd have to think about it twice. But people don't think about that. They think about themselves. And you might be in pain. You might be overwhelmed. You might be hurt. But the example of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus today, is to forgive the people that have wronged you. I'm not saying become best friends with them. I'm not even saying that there's reconciliation. See, we do this in the church all the time, where we're like, forgive them, and what we mean by forgive them is now be best friends with them. That's not what Jesus is doing here. But unforgiveness is a prison that locks you up, holds you back, and paralyzes you. And what Jesus does in his last moments Instead of blaming, accusing, he forgives. And he releases himself and them from that prison. The second thing he does, and I think this is amazing, ultimately, it's he invests in his relationships. This man is in pain. He is on a cross. He can't breathe. They've broken his legs. He's been beaten and bruised and absolutely abused. And he takes the time to actually care for his mother as he's hanging on the cross. This is what it says. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple who he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. He makes sure that as he is dying, because he's the firstborn son in a Jewish family, that his mother is actually being taken care of. He gives the responsibility of caring for his mom to this disciple, who, by the way, is the only one that has stuck around at this point. Everyone else is gone. Jesus could have, and we wouldn't blame him, be on the cross in pain and just say, you know what, give me a minute. Like, I can't breathe. I'm overwhelmed. I'm bloody. I can't see a thing. Like, you don't know what I'm going through. You have, no, you, you have no idea how much pain I'm in. The expectation for most of us is when we're in pain and we're in sorrow, what is it? That other people would come to our aid. And yet, what does Jesus do? In his pain and in his sorrow and in his difficulty, he invests in his relationships. He takes time to make sure that people around him are cared for. Listen, you and me go through things. We go through a lot of stuff. We're in pain. Many of us have relationships that are in tattered all around our whole lives. And yet, 
the reason why they're not getting better is because we expect people to first run to us because we're the ones that are in pain and we're the ones that are in sorrow. The example of Jesus, though, shows us something a little bit different. That even in your pain, even in your sorrow, you still have a responsibility to invest in the people that matter the most in your life. It's easy to push people away. Because when we do it, it allows us to feel as though that we don't have to have the responsibility of caring for their needs in the middle of it. And yet, the example of Jesus is very much opposite. When you're in pain, when you're in difficulty, instead of pushing people away or pulling away, invest in others. Invest in the relationships that matter the most. third thing he does, and I think this is great too. I think this is all great. He comforts others in their pain. Not only does he invest in his relationships, but there's this one person on a cross on one side of him. Well, there's two people actually, and they start mocking him. (laughs) If you really say who you think you are, you should, you know, just get off the cross. Who are you? What's going on? They're both joining in. But eventually, one of the guys actually stops. And says to the other guy, you need to shut up now. Like, obviously, this guy's going through it. Like, there's something special going on here. And this is the conversation they have. The thief says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. There's a switch for him. He recognizes that there's something going on here. He just spent most of the day making fun of Jesus I'm going to tell you right now, if I was Jesus and somebody was making fun of me and I had the power to be like, well, you know what? Paradise is not for you, man. You want to spend time making fun of me? Well, let me tell you who's going to make fun of you in a second. Is that what he says? No. Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. He takes time to comfort this person who has just spent moments making fun of him. And yet he sees that there's a switch. The guy asks for something that he doesn't deserve. He asks for something that obviously, probably the reason why he's on the cross is because he's probably, you know, not a decent human being. A thieving human being is what we learn. He's on the cross for a reason. By all accounts, we have this whole thing in our heads that just bad people shouldn't even have a moment in time where they could actually think that they could get close to God. They don't do the right stuff. You know, they don't go to church every week. This guy probably didn't even read his Bible one time. Wasn't part of a small group. Probably cussed twice. Did some things he probably shouldn't have done. I guarantee you he didn't tithe. It's too late now. And instead of Jesus saying, you know what? You're a horrible human. It's too late. What does he say to him? No, I recognize. Something's changed. He gives him hope. He comforts him. And gives him what he needs in the, in the last few moments of this man's death. You remember, they're going through the exact same thing. Jesus could have easily said, look, man, I'm going through it too. What are you talking about? I don't have time for this. Instead, he takes the moments to comfort others. The person beside him that's going through the exact same thing. And by the way, the example of Jesus, he calls us to do the exact same thing. To comfort people in their pain as much as when we're in ours. And one more thing. This is the last thing. Jesus is honest about his disconnection to God. We never talk about this one because it makes us very uncomfortable. But if you go to the verse, 
there's this part of Matthew where he says, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out, to, to, out in a loud voice. And it doesn't matter how you say this, okay? Everyone says it's different. Eloi, Eloi, labat sabatani, whatever, however you say it. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, you got some really creative theologians. You know what a theologian is? Somebody who actually like, studies the Bible on a regular basis. And so you got so many different, you have so many different views on this. Some people will say, well, no, Jesus is just making a statement because he's referring to a psalm here. Right? So he's like, oh, well, Jesus is making a statement to all the religious Jews so they understood what was going on. Because when you read the psalm, it's actually quite ho hopeful. David talks about how he feels completely abandoned by God, but by the end of the psalm, it's very hopeful. So they go that way. Other people that just say, look, like God abandoned him because now he was separating from God. He was taking on the sin of the world, and now God couldn't look at him. Okay, sure. No matter how you splice it, Jesus, who is God, is in public now, completely naked, on a cross, dying. If he wanted to pull out the Marvel superhero side of it, he would have just sat there and breathed hard and, you know, just said, I can muscle this out. Wouldn't let anybody know that there was this moment in time where he felt abandoned by God. He could have. And yet, what does he do here? In front of everybody who was watching him die, instead of muscling it through and acting like everything is fine, he says publicly, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's honest about what he's feeling in that moment around his disconnection from the God that he loves. The example of Jesus shows us very clearly that for many of us, what we try to do, and I, I think this is true of many people who have grown up in church and been around church, we try to muscle through when we feel disconnected from God. How's it going? Everything's good. Yeah. How's, how's, how's your spiritual life? Oh, it's great. I'm doing fine. Oh, good. Yeah. You know, I'm, I might be doubting. Oh, you're doubting? <laughs> Come on. Jesus is good. At some point in your life, and there's a lot of good um, history on this, everyone goes through something called a dark night of the soul. Okay? It's a moment in time where for a season of your life, you're just like, I don't even know where God is right now. I'm struggling with this. Is he real? Is he there? Hello? When I pray, I feel like everything just hits a ceiling and comes back down at me. We try to muscle through that season alone and without being transparent and honest. Act like everything's okay, and yet that does more hurt than it does actually help. And yet Jesus, in his last moments on the planet, doesn't even try to muscle it through. In front of everybody, his mother, the only disciple that has been left with him, all of the people that have wanted to watch him die, the Romans now that are just trying to keep the politics all going, instead of trying to be proud and just muscle it through, he admits that he feels disconnected from God. My encouragement to you today on this Good Friday is follow the example of Jesus. You might be here and you might feel disconnected from God. You might feel like every prayer that you are praying currently is just hitting a ceiling and coming right back down. You might feel overwhelmed at this idea of being connected to God because everything you try isn't working. The only way you can get through that season is if you follow the example of Jesus and be honest about how you're feeling at this moment. Finding people that you can connect with that can guide you through that. Because let me tell you, I know a ton of people who have been in that season and have walked to the other side of it and are doing very well now. But you trying to muscle it through yourself is going to 
do more harm than it will ever help. And you can't do it alone. There's a famous German theologian, his name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He actually was a guy that fought against the Nazis in World War II. He says this, there's a quote, and I, I think it's really good. He says, Good Friday and Easter free us to think about other things far beyond our own personal fate, about the, the ultimate meaning of life, suffering, and events. And we lay hold of a great hope. What Good Friday does, when we look at the example of Jesus, it shows us how we can actually take the stuff of our faith, of what's in the Bible. And he shows us how to live it out in the hardest moments of our lives. He shows us how not to give up, how to still show love and compassion and care in the middle of moments in time where normally people would just fall back and completely be crushed. He shows us how to live by God's spirit in the toughest moments, in the darkest places, and the most uncomfortable of situations. And there's this verse, this crazy verse in the Bible that says, you know, the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead is the same spirit that lives inside of you and me. And if this is how Jesus, who is fully filled with the spirit, can live his life in the harshest moments of his end, you and I literally can face anything. So when you're in pain and you're going through it, there's some things you can do. Some ways you can live that can change everything. Let's pray. In band or band? Couple? You? Okay, yeah, okay. Come on. Jesus, thank you for the fact that in the middle of your sorrow and your pain and your difficulty in the last moments of your life you didn't make it all about you in fact if you did I don't think we would be here for many of us on this good Friday Lord we've come to church because we've done it for a long time this is what it is. It's Good Friday, so you go to church. Yet some of us had a difficulty getting here because of the pain and the sorrow in our own hearts. Some of us had a hard time because we're confused about where we stand on things. Because every time we pray, it feels like it falls right back down to us. For some of us, Lord, we, we have past where we have been taken advantage of and abused and it has really clouded our minds because we want the worst for the people that have done that to us. How dare they? And for some of us, Lord, we watch the world around us and the people in our own families and our own lives who are in pain It's difficult to give them what they need because we haven't received what we need. It's hard to comfort others in their pain when we're in just as much pain. Who's there for me? And yet, Lord, th this whole gospel story that you've just shown us from Matthew all the way to John shows us a God that is there to help us when we can't forgive, who's there to walk us through our pain and our sorrow so we can help others, and who's there when we doubt and we don't even know if you're even real.
And Father, as we go into this time of communion to remember what it is that you've done for us, Lord, I pray that we would bring with transparency and honesty to you the stuff going on in our lives and in our hearts. The things that we can't give up, the stuff that is overly difficult, the places where we doubt that you could even help us. Lord, as we take time to reflect on what it is that you've done for us, that we would turn all that over to you. So that you can start healing our hearts and our minds and our spirits. Ushers, if you would come. Pastor Matt's going to lead us through a few, uh, a, a song or two as these folks get ready. When they're at their stations, there are going to be three, one uh, on on this side, in the middle, and onto that side. When they're standing there ready and willing, I would ask you to start coming, grabbing your emblems and hold on to them, okay? We're going to go through this together and remember how good God is to us through what he did on the cross on the Good Friday. All right. Whenever you're ready, come grab one of these emblems. You can go back to your seat and hold on to it. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain. One spot in holidays that I love the most is the family table. Anybody? You love you love just getting together for meals. Anybody like that? I got a few nods. Most people you don't like your families. I can see that. That's fine. That's good. For me, it's one of the most exciting places, especially growing up. I remember we'd get together for holidays, and my parents and you know my uncles, aunts, we'd be sitting there, and people would be laughing, having a good time, or getting angry and throwing shoes. You know, either, like it didn't matter. Everyone's together. It's great. What do you do at a family table? Right? You tell stories about the past. Right? Uncle John's talking about the one time that he almost died going down the road doing something. As a family, you talk about the present. What's going on right now? So-and-so is you know, graduating, going to school. Oh, this person's not doing so great. Have you heard from so-and-so? And the third thing you do at a family table is you talk about the future. Right? Like, man, isn't it going to be great when little Johnny is, you know, 18 and can move out of the house and not pay, you don't have to pay for him to eat anymore. It's going to be great. But that's what we do. We talk about the past, we talk about the present, and we talk about the future. 
And for many, what we don't realize about the communion table is it's the family table. It's exactly what we're doing today. Every time we take communion, we remember what Jesus has done. We talk about what he's doing right now. And we look forward to what he's going to do in the future. So let's start with the past. How many people, you would say, Jesus has done some great things for you? Come on, saw you through some stuff, walked you through some valleys, wiped away some tears. How many people he's doing something today? You know, he's doing something right now. You might be going through it currently, and yet you just know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's with you. And for many of us, too, the reality is that he's going to do some great things. You know the pain that you have now on the planet, the stuff that you are overwhelmed by, the truth of what his word says is that someday he's going to wipe away every tear. There will be no more pain. That all of the stuff that you struggle with, the things that overwhelm you, the world that you see and scares you is actually going to be brought into a moment of peace. That's the hope that we have. So as we take these emblems today, I want you to think about that, okay? When we start saying things like, you know, let's give him some... Um, thanks for what he's done for us. I want you to think about the things that he's done, the stuff that he's doing, and the hope that you have in the future as we go through each part of this. So in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says very clearly, talking to the Corinthian church, the communion is a time for us to be united together. He says, for I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Together, let's take the symbol of the body of Jesus that was broken for us. Just take a moment to lift your voice, lift your heart, tell him how great he is, how good he is, how thankful we are for what he's done, for what he's doing, what he's going to do. Go ahead. Jesus, we thank you for the brokenness of your body. We acknowledge, Lord, that in the garden, you had this conversation with your father where you asked if that could be passed, the cup could be passed from you to make it happen. And yet, if if it could not, would his will, not your will, be done? You knew that you were about to be broken and bruised. You knew that you were about to go through things that no human being could be able to endure on their own if it was not for love. And Jesus, you endured it because you love us. Because you wanted us. Because you wanted to reconnect what was lost in the Garden of Eden. We thank you for that, Lord. Then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's take together the symbol of the shed blood of Jesus. Would you just lift your voice? Let's go thank you for the cross. And 
Once again I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you. Once again I pour out my life. Would you stand today and let's sing this together? Once again I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you. Once again I pour out my life. Thank you for the cross. Sing this out today. Thank you for the cross. Come on, lift your voice. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross. Oh, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross. today as you go it's not how you start it's how you finish and you might be in the middle of your faith journey and you might have seen some bumps in the road you might be doubting you might be discontent you might be discouraged I want to encourage you it's not how you start it's how you finish press in Rely on people around you to help you. You don't have to muscle it through yourself. So today as you go, take some time to think through the great sacrifice of what Jesus has done. Remember, Sunday is coming. Yeah? Good. Just, um, yeah. If we had a big choir, we could have done something awesome there. We could have, yeah. God bless you guys. Thank you for coming. If you, uh, we're not pushing this this morning, but if, if you uh, would like to give, uh, our ushers are at the back with the offering plates. You can give on your way out. But God bless you. Have a great Friday. If you're part of our church community and you're helping out with the Easter egg hunt tomorrow, uh, be here by noon. Um, and then we'll see you Sunday, Easter Sunday. Uh, it's the Super Bowl, baby. Let's go. Come on. God bless you. Have a great day.